Man, sometimes when you wake up in the morning with a mix of sleep, you have to fresh and open your eyes all wide. <laughs> Amen. So today we're going to talk about how to be trustworthy. Last week we were talking about um, the arm of flesh and how the arm of flesh will fail you. And uh, uh, we see how much humanity and how the Bible is telling us do not trust in man. Rely on me, rely on me, rely on me. And so as children of God, we are representatives of Christ. And the Bible says that as he is, so are we in this world. So we are representing Christ here. So if we are representing Christ here with all the dishonesty, that will not be good, even for the Lord. So the Lord himself cannot trust us. So how are we even trustworthy to the Lord himself, to one another? Amen. Because the tendency that we have, even in believing in God, we have that tendency in believing in one another. And so it's very essential. It's one of the most integral parts of our relationship. And by the way, what does it mean to be trustworthy? So trustworthiness involves four major qualities. It has to do with integrity, has to do with honesty, promise keeping, and loyalty. In other words, promise keeping, you can talk about being reliable and accountability. And each of these principles are things that show that someone is trustworthy. When And it's, it's something, trustworthiness is something that is earned. It's not something that we just like, fall on you on one day and you just grow up it's a standard of life that you're living and you can be held accountable you can be considered to be trustworthy because of a track record and um for one of my classes that i taught before i spoke about um people always evaluating us on daily basis and it's when you pass someone's evaluation test then they consider you to be trustworthy on each and every day. Everything we say, you're being evaluated. And you might not know, you, you are being evaluated as well as you are evaluating one another. And now let's listen to what the Lord says in Job 1, verse 6 to 8. And in Job 1, verse 6 to 8, it says that one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming through the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and all right. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Hallelujah. So we meet with the Lord talking about Job. The way that God talks about Job it's a track record that he has had based on the relationship that he has with Job. Because if you start reading from verse 1, it talks about Job, Job being upright and also trying to cover up for his children anytime they had a party just to make sure in case any child even sinned unconsciously. So he will always do sacrifices to make sure that the children don't fall short. So he was very careful, very prudent. He was blameless. He was upright. And the Lord said that there was no one on earth like him. When I read this, I was like, wow, can the Lord be proud of me in this way? So the Lord was proud of who Job was. So looking at the life of Job, we see that that is a man of integrity. He is loyal. And he is trustworthy. He is honest. So the Lord knew who Job was. And so he had confidence in Job that even I send the, the, the troubler of the brethren against Job. There's nothing that Satan can do to change him because his duty is to roam back and forth and destroy the brethren. He has just an agenda to kill to steal and to destroy. So if they give him an opportunity to destroy somebody he's been hoping he can destroy, you can imagine what the devil would do. The only thing that the devil did not have access to was to take away his breath of life. So he could do anything with him. And so that's why he reigned on Job in such a way that if Job did not have faith, if he wasn't a man of integrity, loyalty, and promise keeping, the Bible doesn't tell us um, total details about 
the way Job used to live his life. But you can tell from the way that God is being proud of him that Job actually was a man that had very strong principles and he was a very deliberate man that worshipped the Lord. And God also understood something about Job, that Job wasn't worshipping him because of the things that he had given to him. And that's why he could let the devil go in there and tamper with him. Amen. So, um, Amen. Yeah. So as the as the devil was given that opportunity to deal with him, he dealt with him hands down. He needs he dealt with Job. And the most hurtful part of Job's story is when his wife even would desire to become a widow so that Job can, the best way she thought that Job could, could take away the pain was for him to curse God and die. And in Job 2, verse 7 to, to 8, um, it say, verse, uh, verse 7 to 10, it says that, so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? So even his wife knew that Job was a man of integrity and said, are you still maintaining your integrity? Just curse God and just die. And Job replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So um, we, that's why we as Christians, we don't look at things at only one side. That, okay, because you're serving God is only good and great and mighty things. And the Lord used the life of Job to teach us a lot about, about life itself. And from Job's response, it gives us a whole lot of picture why the Lord has so much confidence in who Job was. So his love for the Lord was not out of selfish gains, was not out of property, it was not out of wealth that he had acquired from the Lord, but his love for God was far deeper and beyond material things. So even if he lost his own children and property, and even if he were to lose his wife, the love that he had, for the Lord, it was far beyond anything that this earth could provide. And that is the integrity that Job had. So I was like, we need to get to this level where we love the Lord because we love him. Not because, oh, we pray to the Lord, give me this, give me that, protect my children, guide me, do that, do this, do that. And we easily get angry with God. And God is like, where is your integrity? Where is the promise that you made to me? Or is it all about God making promises to us and being full of integrity and loyalty and faithfulness? We have to get to that level where we are also trustworthy with God. That's the most important thing about Job is that his integrity was even to the Lord, not even to humanity. You can imagine how he was when he came to humanity, but he was a man of very high principles and he trusted the Lord with all his heart. Amen. And so, the, um, uh, according to Google, integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and moral uprightness. So we have a couple of verses that tell us about integrity. And uh, Proverbs 10 verse 9 says that whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. And Proverbs 28 verse 6 says, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. So Job will rather be in that place where he is poor in health, poor in everything. Because when you start reading about the story of Job, you have his friends who came to visit him. And the way they were talking about Job's situation is they made him feel like he must have done something wrong that God does not punish for nothing that God punishes for a reason so maybe the children of Job sinned or something happened that's why the predicament he was facing because the way Job had the predicament anybody with a human flesh and human understanding you would think that God is actually punishing him for something or he must have done something Job stayed the cause. 
And so Proverbs 11 verse 3 says that the integrity of the upright guides them. And that's what was guiding Job here, his integrity. But the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. You would think that Job was being destroyed for something, but the Lord was at work. He was at work. I really, really admire the integrity that um, Job portrayed in his trustworthiness. I really, really in admiration of it. So now what are some of the ways, how do you become trustworthy? How can you become trustworthy? Now to be trustworthy is not a thing that happens overnight. Like I said previously, it comes as a track record of a lifestyle. It's something that you earn. That's why from the beginning of Job, we hear a record of how Job lived his life. And one of the first um, ways of how to become trustworthy is be of good intentions. Don't always want to get something because you want to benefit from something. Be intentional with what you, you do and have good intentions. If you want to serve or you want to give something to somebody, don't give it because you want to gain something. The most basic one is we always calling one another when we need something from them. And then you start talking how you love them. And after you express your love, then you ask for what you want. When you do that one, twice, the third time, they will be noted for that. So the next time your phone is ringing, they know you're calling to ask for something. They say, I called to check on you that I wanted to ask for this. Now, your record has been for calling because you want something. Sometimes just make it a habit to check on one another. Say, I just want to check on you. How are you doing? And then you can even express your love and you let it go. So we don't go to people because we need them or we want something from them. You already build a track record. That's why when you listen to the parable that Jesus was talking about, the guy who went to his friend's house to go ask for bread at night, you will see that he had had a relationship with his friend. That's why he kept knocking the door because the first thing in the life, like in a society of today, if you want to go knocking on the friend's door at the middle of the night, asking for bread and insisting to that friend, if you don't have a relationship with that friend, you will be called up for trespassing. So you need to have a relationship even with the Lord, a relationship with yourself, a relationship with one another. Be intentional, have good intentions. So, and also looking at the life of Job and the response that the devil gave to the Lord that does he trust in you for nothing? Is it not because of everything that you have given to him? Even the devil knew for sure that Job's faithfulness was because of the world that the Lord had blessed him with. And this also made me to understand one thing that the Bible, as the Lord says in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, that I alone, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you. And sometimes the Lord knows the product of which we are being made and the devil doesn't know. And so he only walks around the things that he sees. He doesn't know the product that you are. And so that's why the Lord himself knew the product that Job was because he made him. So he knew for sure that even the devil doesn't know who Job was. And so he assumed that Job is being faithful because of the things that he has. It's not being faithful because of who the Lord is to him. So he assumed that if all of his wealth is taken away, he will curse God in the face. And to his greatest surprise, Job stayed the cause and he thought to himself that if he inflicts pain and attacks his health, that will pay off. Yet that did not work. And so that's one um, what we have in Job chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. If somebody can read. If not, I will go ahead and read. Can somebody read for us, please? What is it? Job 2, verse 1 to 10. Job 2, 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. Is it on the screen? No, no, it's not. Okay. Yeah, I was about to say, I didn't see it. I know I don't have my glasses. <laughs> I, I can go ahead and read so you don't have to strain your eyes. Mm -hmm. Sister Novet, I'll read it. What, where is it? Job chapter it's... 2, verse 1 to 10. Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I have it. Okay. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Okay. 
On another day, the angels came to present themselves <clears throat> before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth, going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. He still maintains his integrity through your incited, in, incited me against him to ruin him without even any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and his bones, and he will surely curse you to your, to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as, it, as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble and all? This, this Job did not sin in what he said. Amen. I feel his pain. Even the Lord said that he is still maintaining his integrity. And I'm like wondering how the devil was roaming from left to right. And he's like, this man, Job, I took away all his children on one day. I took away all his wealth on one day. I took away all his servants on one day. Why is he still being faithful? What is it about him that he's still being faithful to God about? And he was like, okay, I think I have a better plan. I would just deal with his sin. If I inflict pain on him, that his integrity is going to throw it on one side on one day. And so he goes back to the father and asks permission for skin to skin. When I read that skin to skin, that's the like, it's so hard for us. He wants to excruciate pain to his bone. That's, that's why on the one day he just rained it on him. And Job still has value. So Job's faithfulness to the Lord was far, far beyond his own health, beyond his own self-satisfaction. That's what Paul talks about, being dead to Christ. So it's like, okay, if it is dead, fine, and then I die unto the Lord. And the second uh, way to be trustworthy is to be reliable. So reliability. So trustworthy people are people that keep to their words. Don't say something today and you mean something else. Be reliable. And you can rely on them. You can trust in them. You can believe what they're saying. If they cannot do something, they will say they cannot do it. And they do not build castles in the air. They can fake promises. And also, for trustworthy people, you can trust them with secrets. Not like... Secret, secret, but I mean, when you tell them something, oh, you're not going to hear it elsewhere. And it doesn't benefit anyone if you hear something or hear something about Sister Deja, I need to call somebody really quick and say, oh, did you hear about Sister Deja? She said this. Oh, being quick. And that's why Proverbs 11 verse 13 says, a gossip betrays confidence, but a trustworthy person keeps a secret. A, so... When you have a quick and a sharp mouth, it breaks trust and confidence. Avoid always being in the midst of talking here and there and trying to always pass information that is not necessary, that does not build anybody. Because the moment you keep doing that, you lost trust, you lost your wealth, your, your, your self-worth. And so that's how you break that, that, um, that uh, trustworthiness. To be be expensive with your words. 
it doesn't pay anything to always like pass people's personal information here and there. Amen. And so the Bible is telling us that don't participate in gossip. That's how, because you won't be trustworthy. So another urban one is accountability and honesty. So the life of Joseph is a perfect example of someone who possesses great accountability skills. So no matter how bad the situation was, he stood for the truth and maintained his integrity. So for the past week, we've been studying about the life of Joseph. If um, you've been reading on the forum, you see there's a lot of nuggets that Reverend was actually breaking it down. It's like, I don't have to write so much about Joseph. But Joseph is one of those people that when you read the life of Joseph, despite everything that happened to Joseph, he doesn't even have an iota of hate within him. He stood for the truth and he, he, it looked like he was conscious of the purpose of God in his life. And so he didn't even allow hatred or setbacks or a record of wrong to hold him down. So he was accountable to himself. He was accountable to God and he was accountable to all his bosses. And so he became that blessing that walked into every home and the home was blessed. So even when he met with his brothers, he could have chosen to pay them back in their coins, but he decided not to do that. So revenge wasn't part of his nature. So he was honest. So, and that would explain to us why God would have chosen Joseph to be in the place of, to do what he had to do because his brothers in their nature, they had some shrewdness in them. And throughout all his pain, and when I read this book, um, The Bait of Satan, Joseph is one of those people that the, his lifestyle shows high level of forgiveness, even before the forgiveness is even being asked. Like, even if they never even asked for it, he didn't express that hatred. And so the Bible doesn't give us record, but if he actually expressed that hatred or, uh, or bitterness, towards his brothers, the Bible would have, I'm sure they would have really recorded that. And so we see that in Job chapter 45, verse one to three, where it says that Joseph could stand it no longer there. There were many people in the room and he said to his attendants, out of, out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them he, who he was, then he broke down and wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him and the word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's place. And he said, I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. You see, that was an outburst of love that he had for his brother. I mean, Joseph being in that position, you should have seen his brothers and said, oh, thank God. Faith has brought you to me. Today I'll deal with you guys for all the things that you did to me, for all the toiling, the prison, the suffering in Potiphar's house. I'll deal with you guys today. But he took time to process it. And one thing that we notice about Joseph is that Joseph did not just trust his brothers anymore because they already had a track record of doing terrible things. And so that's why he wanted to make sure that he would test them. And so when you have a track record of always lying, being malicious, not being truthful, or always trying to do something for a reason, you lost your trustworthiness. And so people will always try to test you and see if you're still that person before they can entrust you, even with their words. I, for example, I'll give you an example. If I know that I tell you stuff and you take it and tell people I no longer trust you with my words and I won't tell you anything, no matter what you do, I tell you what you need to hear. I won't tell you things about my life because I know that if I tell you or if something I don't want to anybody to know about it, I won't even mention it to you so, because I don't trust you anymore. So it's, now Joseph is about to bless his brothers, but he has to be able to know that they're no longer who they were. And I kept wondering if they reacted on the other side, what could have been his reaction? So we'll find out in, in Genesis chapter 42. I have to, I'll need to read us if, um, 
uh, if you guys can help me. We have Genesis 42, verse 5 to 24, and Genesis 44, verse 1 to 34. I'll take the first one, Minister Lovett. Okay, thank you. And who will take the second one? 42. I'll take the second one. Okay, thank you. Genesis 42, verses 5 to 25. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So Jacob's sons arrived in Egypt along with others to buy food, for the famine was in Canaan as well. Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was him that, was, that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? He demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he had about them many years before. He said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my Lord, they exclaimed. Your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, they are actually 12 of us. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies. This is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt unless your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison. Then we'll find out whether or not your story is true. By the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you have a younger brother, then I, that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know that you're spies. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am a God-fearing man. If you do as I say, you will live. If you are really honest men, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go home with grain for your starving families, but you must bring your youngest brother back to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth and you will not die. To this they agreed. Speaking among themselves, they said, clearly we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we didn't listen. That's why we're in trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Reuben asked, but you wouldn't listen. And now we have to answer for his blood. Of course, they did not know that Joseph understood them for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now he turned away from them and began to weep. When he regained his composure, he spoke to them again. Then he chose Simeon from among them and had him tied up right before their eyes. Joseph then ordered his servants to fill the man's sacks, the men's sacks with grains. But he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at the top of his sack. He also gave them supplies for their journey home. Amen. 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 So one of the first thing here that we see that Joseph does not even trust his brothers with, in, even though he doesn't trust them at all, is the fact that he doesn't even, he has to see if they qualify for him to trust them with his emotions. Because the first time when he pleaded for mercy, they did not even pay attention to his emotions. And so that happens to us all the time. That you're like, if I cry in front of the is she going to understand what I'm going through? Or is it even worthy for me to do that? Because what does it even matter? And so sometimes we express our emotions to people that we know that they can actually be of help or they understand what you're going through. But now a lot of people use their tears as a means to get what they want. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why they say women have um, crocodile tears because you're crying, but you have crocodile inside of you. So just that was just an aside. But here we meet with Joseph, very emotional. He has seen his brothers. He's full of love. 
but can he trust them one more time? Can he really rely on them? And here they are saying, no, we are honest men. We just came to get food. It's like, no, you're not honest men. You're not. How honest are you? What did you tell father about me? And so they are trying to prove that, no, we truly honest men. We one brother. We come from the same father. So the first thing is they start expressing who they are and start showing their identity. And so when it comes to trustworthiness, it is your identity that is being at stake. And so people know you for your identity. So sometimes despite the identity card that we carry, it's your nature that shows who you are, how you respond to people, how you react to situation, how you put yourself, how you talk back to people. That's your identity. And so somebody, you can be trusted to carry on an assignment because they know that if you say, I will do it, I will do it. You will not say, okay, I'm going to do it. Then you turn around, you look for an excuse why you cannot do what you are supposed to do. And so when it's a, a track record of excuses, then you cannot be trusted. So you're not trustworthy. But it's that you don't even know that when you're giving those um, excuses, you are noted for not being trustworthy. So here with Joseph, you see how he has to put his brothers to the test. He, he is so full of love. And uh, Reuben is telling them that, you see, I told you guys not to do this to this boy. It's because of what we did. And you can imagine how many years, despite the fact that Joseph is, in, is going through what he's going through. He was going through that physically, but his brothers carry Yes. So any other predicament that follows them, they assume that it's because of what they did to their brother Joseph, because what's the relationship with them coming to buy food and then talking about what they did to Joseph right there? We don't have a record of them <clears throat> always recounting what they did to Joseph, but you can tell that this has been an emotional trauma for them for so many years. And so it was time for them to have deliverance. And at the nick of it, they have to test the trouble in it. So they carry this. And if you notice, Benjamin wasn't part of them. It was these other brothers, these other 10 of them. They have to deal with their, 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 their punishment. And so they had this heavy block in their heart that whatever thing that came, they're like, okay, you see, it's, this is the blood of Joseph that is upon our head. I told you guys. But you can tell that after so many years, they actually repented and trying to make amends with themselves. So they have to prove their honesty. They have to prove their accountability. Amen. And so mm -hmm. we can, amen. We can go to the next one, Genesis 44, verse 1 to 34. Genesis 44, 1 to 34. I read from NKJV. Joseph, Joseph's And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not this the one from which my Lord drinks? and with which he indeed practices divinations, you have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And he said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver and gold from your Lord's house? 
with whomever of you, of your servants, it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack cloth to the ground and each opened his sack. So he searched, he began with the oldest and left off with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what did is, it, what did is this you have done? Did you not know that? such a man as I can certainly practice divination. Then Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Oh, how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. Judah intercedes for Benjamin. Verse 18. Then Judah came near to him and said, Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing. And do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, We have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age, who is young, his brother, who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children and his father loves him. Then you said, your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father for if he should leave his father, his father will die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall see my face no more. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord. And our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us. Then we will go down for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons and the one went out from me. And I said, surely he is torn to pieces and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, calamity befalls him. You shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up to the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servants remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Lest perhaps I see the evil that will come upon my father. Amen. Amen. This was such an emotional 
episode right here. So emotional. And so that's why if you read in chapter 45, Joseph could no longer stand. He couldn't stand listening to his brother. So he had to burst out. And he burst out so loud that even the Egyptians could hear what had happened. At some point, I felt like he just wanted to keep Benjamin with himself. But when he saw that his brothers had changed, so he cannot separate them. He himself cannot separate himself from his own siblings. And so he had to express himself. Now they can be trusted. In other parts, when you read, you see that he left them and went out and cried, and then he comes back. Now he express, he could trust them with his emotions. He couldn't hold himself anymore. And so he burst out and he cried and like, you have to let it go. And so from there, you see that they begin to build trust. They have to prove themselves. But how often do we have opportunities to prove ourselves? Because life is the only opportunity we have that we, we change. Change is the only thing that is constant. So people change and life happens. And so you learn from the errors of the past. And so you can tell for sure that the brothers of Joseph had actually learned from the errors of the past and they're ready to make amends, even if their brother Joseph wasn't there according to their belief. Amen. And I think that was the last slide that we had. Is there any questions, comments for this very short lesson that we had? No I just want to thank you so much for the teaching. It's very, very, very um. It brings it. It's very. It's personal. It speaks personally to us. You know, to you as you're listening. You're already weighing yourself on a scale as the word is coming. So thank you so much for the message. Amen. Amen. I'm glad. Any questions? <laughs> Amen, Minister Lovett. Thank you so much. Amen. It was a wonderful teaching. Um, trustworthiness is something that is um, very vital in the advancement of God's agenda on the earth. Amen. And I think the, the body of Christ at the moment is suffering from a lot of untrustworthiness because the people are untrustworthy. So this is definitely, um, we have a bad reputation actually. And um, people don't wanna go to church because they are afraid that the church is not the right kind of church. It's not built on the foundation of the Holy Spirit. It's built on something else. So we've lost our credibility. Yeah. But like Sister Vera says, it's a, it's a very personal thing. So in order for the body of Christ to reflect that you can trust us, it's us individuals who have to become trustworthy first. Right. And then together we present a front that the unbelievers can trust because unbelievers don't want to come to us if we're going to use them and abuse them and trick them out of their money and give them false prophecy. And I mean, there's just so much nonsense going on. Right. So when we present ourselves as trustworthy and another member does and a number, another member does, I think our entire credibility as a, as, as a unit, as the body of Christ will change. So I thank you for this teaching. I really hope it goes out and it touches a lot of people because this is all something we could all work on in our personal lives. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. And uh, this, uh, this popular story that we always had in Cameroon about a lady traveling in the bus with another lady, I think probably Jehovah Witnesses or something, but she had a Bible. And when she had her food after eating, then she turned and told the sister sitting beside her, can we share the word of God? And the person sitting beside her was hungry and was like, are you church people really this selfish? 
that you will eat. You don't say, let's share food. Now let us share the word of God. So, (laughs) 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 that's like, yeah, that's like, you can't share common food and you want to tell me about the love of Christ. The love of Christ is expressed by our actions. Amen. Let's share this bread that I have. Then the person becomes relaxed. You become friends. You start chatting. Then you bring the word of God in. He's going to listen to you. If not, they're not going to listen to you. They're like, no, you guys are even selfish. And how can you Mm -hmm. teach generosity at that spot? And so that's where even honesty also comes because you can't be dishonest that you want to take the Bible and say, okay, the Lord is saying this, trust in the Lord. And you're like, no. Mm. it doesn't work that way so it's a lifestyle that's why christianity is a lifestyle we are the living active word of god that comes with our words our actions are this i always give example of just regular driving because people will piss you off on the road every second of the day someone will cross over are you going to curse or you're going to bless that person (laughs) 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 so we can start from there Amen. 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 And so, all right, family, if we do not have any questions, I am so glad that there were no questions. I'm like, okay, therefore, I would really explain myself very well. So we can go ahead and pray. Um, does anyone have a prayer request? Yes, I do. Okay, all right. Oh, th- thank you very much first for the words. I'm, I'm so happy. And then uh, too, I see uh, myself, especially in our daily lives. I always learn that we have to be trustworthy for to advance. So my prayer request is, uh, we have, I have an, a presentation today. We have an event today at the, uh, uh, they call it a francophonie. I'm actually in the kitchen trying to, because I need to present um, our Cameroon culture and diversity. So, and I have a presentation. I just want God's uh, spirit, the Holy Spirit to direct me do everything today. Amen. 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 That's a good one. I'm going to pray for that. Any other prayer requests? All right, so let's all pray for Brother Bertrand because he has been entrusted in the kitchen and so he, he has been entrusted with the position to um, do a presentation. And so because you were trusted with that, they qualified that you are good at that. So we pray that the Lord will help you to be able to be very expressive and be clear in your words and whatever you present will give glory to God. Amen. So Father, Amen. in the name of Jesus, as we, the children, come to pray for your son, O Lord. Father, we thank you for who he is. We thank you for where you brought him so far. <clears throat> Father, we pray that, Lord, as he holds the mic, you will talk through him. But I, may you bring the spirit of boldness. Because you haven't given him a spirit of fear, but you've given him a spirit of boldness, a sound mind. So let him be bold, let him be loud, let him be audible, and let him be understood. May he choose the right words, let him be succinct with his word. And we pray for the spirit of excellence, that as he cooks, whatever he does, it will be very tasty and it will bring glory to your name because it's an expression of your glory is an expression of your creation is an expression of your pride in the kitchen so father we say thank you. thank you lord for your grace thank you lord because you are amazing and you are worthy you are exalted thank you jesus mighty name we pray amen amen so my prayer is to pray for us to be trustworthy in that we build that um that part of being trustworthy we build it it's a, it's a lifestyle so mm-hmm. yes there are areas of our lives where we haven't been trustworthy with the areas of our life where we will not be honest with pray that the lord helps us to be trustworthy at our jobs 
because mm -hmm. sometimes when they trust you at the job site, you say, oh, Lover, can you do this presentation? Bertrand, can you do this presentation? Because they've seen that you can do that. So you're a bit entrusted with that. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you don't do it well, next time they'll learn not to give it to you because you messed up the last time. You failed the evaluation test. So um, mm -hmm. we pray to be trustworthy, even in our words. Be trustworthy because when the Lord gives you an assignment, it's because you are trusted by him. And so he thinks that he knows that you have the ability to do it. And so let us not even fail ourselves in doing that. And whatever responsibility we take, let us be able to carry on. So Father, in the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. we your children come before you with our weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Father, we fall short of your glory every day of our lives. But Father, we want restitution, just like Joseph and his brothers, who had to prove their honesty to their brothers. Father, we pray that if there's any area in our lives that is still lacking honesty, lacking promise keeping, lacking accountability and reliability, oh God, Father, we pray that Lord you help us to be trustworthy citizens. Help us to be trustworthy parents. Help us to be trustworthy friends and siblings and loved ones to our spouses and to our kids as well so that we show them by example. Father, we pray that you help us to be trustworthy. Yes. Help us, Abba, Father. We begin to plead your mercy where we fail you. We plead your mercy over where we have failed each other. We plead your mercy where we need to seek for attention instead of being trustworthy. We plead your mercy where we have been people pleaser, trying to please people because we want to portray an image. But Father, help us, Father, to seek your face just like Job was seeking your face, no matter what his friends were telling him, no matter the circumstances. No matter the pain, but he relied on you and on you alone. Father, let us speak in whatever we do, in whatever we say, in our Let it be about you, not about us, so that we can learn to be dead in Christ, our life in Christ, so that we exalt your name. Father, we are your servants, oh God. Use us at your will, because you are the potter and we are the clay, oh God. Father, you can decide to scatter it into pieces and have it in the world. We trust our trust. We need to cover this work today with the blood of Jesus. Cover everyone that was able to join today with the blood of Jesus. So we pray that your word becomes active and becomes alive in us. That it begins to yield fruit and it bears millions of fruits from generation to generation. To the glory of your most holy name. Pray for the next watch that is coming up. We pray for those who are able to join, those who will not be able to join. We pray for your servant who will be speaking, O oh Lord, that you pray that you empower and nourish her, that she is able to transmit your message. Father, we thank you for all the watches. We thank you for all the ministers as well. Let your name be glorified. We pray for everyone that was able to join the watch today, O oh Lord. We pray that you bless them, bless their families, bless their children, and Lord. Has been learning to be trustworthy, to help us to be accountable and to be reliable and to be honest in Jesus' mighty name. We pray, amen and amen. 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 And thank you guys. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much.